Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Sunday. It's nice to see some visitors here and stuff this morning. Um, man, that worship was really fun. I love to worship. I don't know if anybody noticed that, but if you ever look back there and I'm running the sound, I'm usually a blubbering mess. But uh, that last song, Defender, as, as we were singing that, in my mind I'm just, I'm thinking of all the different times in the Word where God went before and defended people. He went before and like, you know, he, he uh, told, I believe it was King David, just wait until you hear the sound of footsteps going through the trees and then go ahead. You know, he goes before Gideon. Um, put fear in the camp of the, uh, the enemies of God's people and gave them dreams that they were about to be wiped out, you know. Um, he used King David before he was a king. He was just this little dude to go out and kill a seasoned warrior. That's our God. He, he does the unexplainable to go before you and defend you. And I'm just sitting back there like, wow. How many times has he defended me? How many times has he gone before me? You know, the Word tells us that he goes before us and he prepares a way for us. But it also says that he, he literally sets a table in the presence of our enemies. <laughs> so we get to dine, we get to chill, sit back, and eat some food in the presence of our enemies without having to worry. Why would we not have to worry? Because He takes care of it. He's got it. It doesn't matter what your enemy is. It doesn't matter what the circumstance or situations uh, are that you're in right now. Rest in Him and know that He is God. Be still and know. I, I love it. So anyway, welcome to Church on the Rock, Harrisonville. Um, some friends of mine came. We've got... Uh, Garrison from North Carolina. That's a little bit of a drive just to listen to me preach. I'm just kidding. Um, we've got Daniel from Indiana. We've got Andrew from Texas. He's getting married in a few days. That's awesome, dude. I'm so, so happy that you're getting married. Um, they actually came up because the property that, uh, that I have, I don't really have a whole lot of rules on. And, uh, we get to do things there that maybe you can't do in other cities and things like that. So we, uh, we always have some fun whenever they come up. So thanks for being here. And welcome to all the other visitors as well. It's great to have you. I just want to thank God for all the, the awesome things that he does. You know, the word tells us that we can um, enter into his courts with thanksgiving and, and his... Uh, uh, enter into his house with praise and thanksgiving. I, I forget the exact words, but the point is whenever we come into his presence, we need to thank him. And the word does tell us that he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's always with us. So I would just encourage you guys that, that no matter what you're going through, try to continue to have a, a heart of thanksgiving, a heart of praise. He loves that, and it, it lets him know that we trust him no matter what we're going through. And he's given us so much to be thankful for. So um, Lyle and Ashley Ball, the, um, Ashley's brother, had surgery on his back, and he's, he's doing pretty good. He's in recovery. And um, James and Chelsea, they're not with us today because her dad had a heart attack, and he had surgery and stuff, and so they're down there with him until Tuesday, but... We also want to continue to pray for Myra's cousin, uh, Artis, who has pneumonia. Any any updates on that? St. Louis? Wow. Back of, of the blood, and it was flowing the wrong way from a leaky valve. 
That's amazing. Isn't it wild that God has given? So praise, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. That's outstanding. And they had room to be able to get her there, even though circumstances were starting to stack against her, right? But God has given humans wisdom and knowledge and understanding to be able to tell that the blood in somebody's body is flowing backwards. That just blows my mind. I'm like, how in the world? But he's an awesome and mighty God. I wanted to um, read you guys something from an email that I received from Voice of the Martyrs. Has anybody ever heard of that ministry before? Yeah. Um, Outstanding ministry, but I follow them and I get their emails and stuff. And so I wanted to tell you about this this guy um, who is in prison in the Horn of Africa. Iridia is the the name of the the country, essentially, I guess, or the whatever you call the states in Africa. And it's the eastern part of the Horn of Africa. It's it's um, surrounded by Ethiopia, Sudan, Djibouti, and the Red Sea. Not too long ago, we would think that that was a long way away, but it's just not a long way away. This is a small world. and But this guy, his name is Muzi uh, Izaz, and he was arrested in 2007, 17 years ago, for witnessing to youth, for ministering to youth about Jesus Christ over there. He's been in prison for 17 years. Let me read you this email. It says that he he is married and has three children, was arrested in September 2007 for his work as a youth minister with the Word of Life Church. He had worked as an evangelist for 14 years and served with youth for Christ for a number of years before establishing a youth ministry at the um, Word of Life Church. It says, after his arrest, Muzi was taken to a small village prison staffed by young soldiers. Young soldiers, anybody familiar with that? Like child soldiers is what that's talking about. Children. Maybe 10, 12 years old with AKs that have been kidnapped from their families and brutally tortured and trained to be young soldiers. I mean, from teeny tiny age. Mind-blowing stuff. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around because we're not used to that kind of thing, right? But it says that he managed to escape with the help of fellow Christians, and after calling his family to say goodbye, he headed for the border. Upon reaching a border town about 60 miles from the village, he called his family to let them know he had made it. But shortly afterward... Uh, the Etrian authorities arrested him before he could cross into a neighboring country. So he escapes, travels for 60 miles, and gets captured again. It says, for a long time after his arrest, Muzi's family had no knowledge of his whereabouts and no information about his health. The Etrian uh, believers feared he had been killed or left alone in a remote prison cell in the desert. These remote prison cells that they're talking about are shipping containers. Shipping containers that are left out in the middle of the blistering desert specifically to imprison Christians. And they're given just enough food just to stay alive to torture them for a long time. This is happening today. Today there are people in those shipping containers right now. It goes on and says, however, more recent reports indicate that Musi is in Asmara, um, which is Heredi's capital, in a maximum security crime investigation unit for being a Christian, for ministering to, to youth. He's in a maximum security crime investigation unit where many other church leaders have been imprisoned, some for more than 10 years. As with other Christians imprisoned here, 
Muzi has been held without charge or trial. His family does not know if he will ever be released. You can pray for his family, and you can even write encouraging letters to him and other imprisoned Christians by visiting um, prisoneralert.com if you're interested in doing that. But then it goes on, and it, uh, it talks about how we need to be offering spiritual encouragement and practical assistance as much as we can. And then it ended with this verse, and I think that this verse is extremely powerful for us. It says, remember those who are in prison as though in person with them and those who are mistreated since you are in the body. We are the body of Christ. We need to remember people that are suffering for Jesus Christ all around the world. It does happen here too, but obviously other countries at the moment have it considerably worse than we do. What I found interesting was this, this region, it consists of a number of faiths. I, I did a little research on it, and it says the two major religions are Christianity and Islam. This is according to Wikipedia. However, the number of adherents of each faith is subject to debate, obviously. Estimates of the, of the Christian share of the population range from about 47 to 63%, while estimates of Muslim share the population range of 37 to 52. It goes on and it talks about how it makes up the population there, but... It also says that there are different kinds of Christianity there. Like some completely adhere to the Christian faith. Some, some have it kind of mixed in with other beliefs and other faith. It talks about the Muslims there are predominantly Sunni. But apart from the officially recognized denominations of Christianity and Sunni Muslims, all other faiths and denominations are in principle required to undergo a registration process. In practice, they are not allowed to register. Um, so if they don't register their faith, it says that they can't practice their faith. And so that's kind of how they're, they're catching them and imprisoning them. It says, among other things, the government's registration system requires religious groups to submit personal information on their membership to be allowed to worship. So, if you haven't filled out your personal information, fill it out and put it in the back. No, just kidding. We're, we're certainly not going to do that, right? But, I just felt that it was, it was very necessary that we continue to keep these things in the forefront of our minds. Um, because sometimes it's really easy to take for granted that we get to come and sit in a church and share Jesus Christ and the love that He has for us and the things that He's done for us with other believers without worrying that we could be taken and thrown in a shipping container in the middle of the desert and left there for dead. It's important that we remember the benefits that we have in this country right now and thank God for it. All right. So, if you would, open with me to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. So, last week, Pastor Rod talked about... Um, talked about Paul and Barnabas and how when they, uh, they were trying to preach the gospel that some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and they started to debate what they were saying and, and essentially in chapter 14 verse 19, 20 talks about how they showed up and they won the crowds to their side. They, they didn't like what Paul and Barnabas were saying. And so, they stoned Paul and dragged him out uh, to the outskirts of town. 
and they left him for dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. So they left him because they thought he was dead. They stoned him so bad, and he, he very likely could have been dead. They left because they're like, job is done. And then the believers get around him. I'm sure they're praying for him. Uh, imagine if your friend just got stoned to death and drug outside of town, and now you're left here with him. There's no hospital. There's no um, medical evac or anything like that. The ambulances aren't coming. They're, they're left with the option to pray over him. They pray over him. And he got up and went back into the town. That, I mean, he's pretty bold, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a bold move. If, if people just stoned me in this town, I don't know that that would be my first choice of where I'm going back to. But this, Paul and Barnabas, they're, they're driven by a directive that God has given them to go share the gospel. He didn't say, go share the gospel unless people try to kill you. Then you can stop. He said, go do what I've called you to do, right? And so then, right after this, the next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. But then right after that, it says, after preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia. That might not sound like a big deal, but that's literally where the guys that just stirred everybody up to stone them came from. That's where they came from, and they're like, hey, remember those guys that, that killed us, you know, tried killing us? Um, they live over here, let's go over there. <laughs> I'm like, this is nuts, man. This is crazy. But I just thought that that was pretty neat. And then a little bit later it says, finally they returned by ship to Antioch of Syria. So remember, we've got two different Antiochs. Antioch of Syria is the first Antioch that Paul stopped in on his first missionary journey, and Antioch of Pisidia was up in um, uh, a little bit farther north up there. So there is a little bit of a difference there. So starting in uh, chapter 15, it says, While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you're circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. People are following these guys to give them a hard time. Now, I will give it to you. The guys that were following them around, they were passionate. They were trying to teach the law as they were brought up. They literally thought they were working on behalf of God to do the right thing. So they're following these guys around because they believe that they're wrong. The Holy Spirit was not revealing the truth to them. Paul is so passionate about going in all these towns that he would go into. He would go to the synagogue and he would try to preach to them, showing, proving that Jesus is the Messiah through all of the prophecies, through all of the, uh, the law and the prophets, the whole Old Testament because the Holy Spirit revealed to him and showed him, this is what it means. It's all pointing to Jesus. And then Paul meets Jesus, and he's like, I can't not preach it. I can't not lay it out for these people, because these are God's people. They're made in His image. They're made in His likeness. Yes, they're trying to kill me, but He loves them too. So He's doing what He's been called to do. So, everywhere that He's going, these people are trying to come and just derail his ministry. And, and look at what they're saying. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Hmm. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. So here they are in a big group of believers. People start opposing them, and they, these good Christian men, start arguing vehemently. So what vehemently means is forceful, passionate, or intense. They're, they are forceful. They're passionate to argue with these people. It would be interesting if, 
if we were in here teaching, preaching, Rod's up here preaching, and somebody stands up and starts arguing with him, I mean, our services would look totally different. They would be pretty entertaining. Um, but they would be totally different. And we're going to see how this kind of plays out and how it looks in the early church whenever these, these types of things started happening because people are trying to figure out what does this walk with Jesus Christ look like? What is actual salvation? How is He the Messiah? What does that even mean, you know? So it says, Finally the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. Notice the word finally there at the beginning. This argument had been going on so long, they probably tried everything, and they're, they're like, listen, we've had enough. Go to the apostles, those that walked and talked and lived with Jesus. Go to the elders of the church in Jerusalem and get an answer to this thinking question. We're tired of listening to you guys argue about this. So they send them out. It says, the church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They're like, we're going that way anyway. You know, let's stop and see some of our friends, see how the church is doing there, because Paul and Barnabas, they were literally building up elders and leaders in the church. And so they're going right by there where they've already been, and they want to stop and talk with them about it. And it says, they told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. So that's how we can see how early this is, this is in, in uh, the church that Jesus Christ was, was Lord over. They didn't, a lot of places didn't even know that Gentiles could come into a relationship with God. They thought that it was just for the Jews. And so whenever they're hearing this, they're like, sweet, this is great news. Everybody was filled with joy. Probably not nearly as much as the Gentiles were. You know, um, this is, it, it's kind of encouraging for us because we're reading what Paul and Barnabas and the early church brothers uh, and sisters did, like how they operated. And it's good to see that they didn't always get along, you know, because we don't always get along, right? We see church splits. You might not agree with what I always say or what, what Rod always says. Sometimes I don't know if I agree with, with what I always say, you know? But it's okay. We're the body of Christ. And so it's, it's great that we get to actually see this kind of being played out. It's great that they documented the difficulties that they had, the struggles that they had, and then what they did to solve those problems. Because we need to know. It says, When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. So they're getting there. They're reporting everything that's going on to to the whole local church there in Jerusalem, which is a huge deal. I mean, this is a very big deal. It says, but then, here they are back in Jerusalem, but then some of the believers, they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe that He died to save their, their sins. The believers who belonged to the sect of Pharisees stood up and insisted that the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So, I get it, you know. These guys are the Pharisees, and, and Paul even said, I was the, Pharisees of, the Pharisee of Pharisees. I was raised up, you know, all that stuff. And so whenever you're so rooted and you're grounded in the, the traditions of the past, it's very, very hard to break away from that. It's like a, a child being raised up in a home that's unhealthy, and they know that it's unhealthy. Sometimes it's hard to break away from those unhealthy habits, you know, because it's what you've seen your whole life. It's what you've experienced your whole life. And these guys, they base their faith on this. This, this circumcision is literally the outward appearance of, or the outward proof that we're God's people. Who else is going to do that to themselves? You know, nobody, nobody's going to do that to themselves. But this shows, and so anyway, 
I could go on and on about that. This is pretty wild. But these guys even get to the church there, and, and even amongst the believers, they're still getting pushback. They're still getting these, these people that are, are constantly at every single turn trying to oppose them simply for doing what God has called them to do. So look what happens in verse 6. So the apostles and the elders met together. Notice how the apostles and the elders, they weren't always the same. They were, they were different, but they helped manage the church. It says the apostles and the elders met together to resolve this issue. They had issues in the church, and they're meeting together to resolve these issues. At the meeting, after a long discussion... I'm sure that was a long discussion too, you know what? It says, after this long discussion, Peter stood up and addressed them as follows. As follows, it says, Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. So first of all, I want to address the fact that that it says some time ago, and we know that back in Acts chapter 10, Peter is over at, at Simon the Tanner's house, and he has the vision, you know, the sheets being lowered down and all that stuff. At the same time, Cornelius, well, days before that, Cornelius is having a vision of Peter being over at Simon the Tanner's house. And he says, God says to Cornelius, send some people to go get Peter to come back here. And so he does that. Peter comes in to the dude's house, and Cornelius is a Gentile. He's actually a centurion in the Roman military who was extremely vicious, very, very vicious. And to rise up in the ranks, you had to prove, prove yourself too, right? So here this guy is, but the Word talks about how, how much of an awesome man that this Cornelius is. And... Peter goes in, he tells him about God, and God literally sends the Holy Spirit, boom! The whole family, not just Cornelius, not just the men in the family, the whole family, men, women, children, his servants even, the people under the, the, the roof of Cornelius, all got slain in the Holy Spirit. They all got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had never been circumcised. They had never followed the the. Um, religious laws and all that stuff. God is shifting and turning a page that no one expected whatsoever. And so Peter's reminding these people, don't you remember? It just wasn't too long ago that this happened. And so I just love that Peter is the one that stands up and starts to address everybody. He says, brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. He says, God knows people's hearts. God knows people's hearts. These people that are arguing, they're making their argument about something physical, some outward appearance. But it's, he's proving right now that God, God knows people's hearts, and that's why he chooses them. It says he con, uh, confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. So God confirmed what he's doing with these people by giving them the Holy Spirit. He confirmed that these are his chosen people by giving, him, by giving them the Holy Spirit. That's, that is absolutely awesome. Peter goes on, he says, He made no distinction between us and them. And my thought as soon as I read that is, then why do we? Who am I to judge people that God doesn't make a distinction between? Why am I to think that I'm better because I dress a certain way or walk or talk or whatever a certain way? I don't get to make that distinction. God does. It's His job. It's not my job. He made no distinction between us and them. Listen to this. For He cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke 
that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. Our ancestors couldn't do it. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know. He's, he's saying they couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. Why are we expecting the Gentiles to do it when God doesn't require it? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Guys, we do have to remember that the grace that He gives us, the mercy that He gives us, is absolutely 100% undeserved. We don't deserve it, but He wants us so much that He gives it as a free gift by faith. I love that. Everyone listened quietly. Whenever He points out that they listened quietly, that tells me that for most of the conversation, everybody was trying to get their point across all at the same time. You know, total chaos. But it says, everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. You know, this is testimony. The Word tells us that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. They're giving their testimony. And when you give your testimony, people listen because it's an experience that you had and nobody can take it away from you. It's something that literally happened to you. They're telling what had literally happened to them and to the people that God chose to do miraculous things through. I love it. Then it says, when they had finished, so, uh, so Paul and Barnabas, they finished talking about all these things, and then James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take them a people for himself. A people for himself. Guys, we're Gentiles, and we are a people for himself. Talking about God the Father. I love that. Think about who's talking here. It says, James stood and said. We hear about James. James is the head of the church in Jerusalem at this time. He's the top dog. He just happens to be the brother of Jesus, who didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah while Jesus walked on the earth until he was crucified, dead, and God resurrected him. You can read in John about where James and his brothers are talking smack about Jesus, you know, wanting him to go into the city and start doing signs and miracles and all this stuff so that they can experience it. But that's how God can change people. That's the guy that's talking here, James, the brother of Jesus. Jesus had multiple brothers, but uh, this one is now heading up the church in Jerusalem. It says, after he's talking about how Peter has explained all this stuff, he says, and this, converse, um, this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. So he's, he's picking up what the prophets were saying. He says, as it is written afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. Listen, sometimes to combat the enemy, you actually need to know the truth. You need to know the Word and what the Word says. It's part of having this relationship with God. We get to have a personal, intimate relationship with Him, but we have to know who He is. You've got to study who He is. The Word, this lays it out for us, and then the more that you know about Him, the more you can understand His love for you. You can be saved and not know this Word inside and out all day long. Like I said a couple weeks ago, the thief on the cross murdered right next to Jesus, didn't have a relationship until that last few moments of his life, right? But 
How much more intimate and personal can you get with Jesus whenever you actually know His Word? How much more can you get um, to know the Father whenever you know His Word? It's super, super important. And it helps you to identify people that try to take the Word and twist the Word, take the truth, and argue with you that it doesn't say what it says. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that. It means something totally different. If you don't know what it says and what it means, then how are, you gonna, how are you going to stand for it? How are you going to stand for truth? It's not going to be possible. I mean, unless the Holy Spirit's just giving you what to say, when to say it, how to say it, which He does do that. But guys, listen, we've got to get into this thing. So then He goes on and He says, so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. They had this, this long conversation. They're hearing both sides of this. And James, being led by the Holy Spirit, makes a judgment along with the elders and the apostles. And he says, My judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating from food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. What he's laying out here is moral issues. He's saying, here's what they need to follow. Here's what's going to be beneficial for them. And he even lays it out here, here in a little bit, and we'll cover that. But it's in... Corinthians 10.23, I don't know if you guys uh, remember this verse, but basically it says that all things are permitted, but not all things are beneficial. There are things that people can do that's lawful. It's just not going to be good for you. You're just not going to have a great outcome by it. Isn't it amazing that the things that are listed out here, they're not difficult it's not something that's going to be hard for them. And in fact, it's all of these are going to be beneficial for them. I also want to bring out the fact that as, as he's laying these things out, that he's reminding people to do all things in love. We have to remember to do all things in love. And also... Um, we need to remember that the Word tells us to not cause your brother to stumble. So if I'm hanging out with somebody that uh, maybe has an issue with something or a problem with something that, that I don't necessarily struggle with, but they consider it a sin to do, then it's foolish for me to do it right there in front of them. Because we are not supposed to cause our brothers and our sisters to stumble. We're not supposed to cause them to fall into sin. And, and you know, I've, had, I've come from a place... Uh, in my own mind, where I've made the argument, well, I don't have a problem with it. Like, why should I be, you know, stuck under what they're dealing with? Like, why should I not be able to do it? You know, and that comes from a place of pride. And we know that God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. We can humble ourselves, and, and everything that we do has to be done out of love. If it's not, it's not good. Not good at all. So moving on to verse 22, it says, Then the apostles and the elders, together with the whole church in Jerusalem, chose delegates, and they sent them back to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report this decision. The men, chose, um, the men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also card, called Barsabbas, and Silas. This is the letter they took with them. So right before I get into that letter that they took with them, it says that the whole church agreed. So that's got to be pretty difficult to get everybody in the whole church to agree on something. Right? <laughs> I mean, think about us these days. We can't agree on hardly anything. It's amazing. But, but the whole church here agrees, and they decide... We're going to write a letter to lay this out. And we're not just going to send the letter. We're also going to send two delegates from our church with 
Paul and Barnabas, who came from there with this issue because people keep following them around. They keep shoving this down their throat, and we're, we're going to finally put an end to it. Wouldn't it have been easier for them to just do nothing about it? I think it, you know, maybe not easier because in the long run, they would have a whole lot of issues still, and those issues would continue and continue. But our human tendency is to just ignore it. If I just turn my head, it's not going to be my problem anymore. And they could have been like, well, this isn't even our problem. This is going on over in Antioch, you know? Like, they'll figure it out. But here's the thing. They're called to be good stewards of God's church, of God's Word. They're called to lead the way that God has called them to, to shepherd God's people. And so by doing nothing, it would literally lead their people down darker, more difficult roads forever. And they even noticed that it was still, it was still penetrating the church in Jerusalem where Jesus himself came back. Like, he was crucified there and came back. But that, that thought process was still penetrating there. So they write this letter. And it was written, it says, This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings, he says. I think I'm going to start um, greeting people like that. Greetings. Greetings. I may or may not do that. It says, We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. I love how he's, he's painting the picture here. He's saying, I understand that this has been going on. I get it, and it's troubled you, and the things that have troubled you have impacted me enough that I'm taking a step to actually do something about this. And he's, he's pointing out, we didn't send these people. What they've taught you is incorrect. We didn't send them. They did not come from us. Because, don't you know, that sometimes the enemy or people that are trying to come against you will make it sound like that they come from a position of authority and they've been sent with the seal of approval from the leaders to do this or that, whenever they don't have any such thing whatsoever. He says, so, we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you the official representatives along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Cyrus, uh, Silas to confirm what we've decided concerning your question. You sent them with a question, we're sending back an answer. Here it is. He says, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. Okay, so verse 28, you know how people say, well, the Bible's written by a bunch of, a bunch of men, a bunch of um, sinful people and all that. It is inspired, it is the inspired Word of God, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and James is laying it out here. This decision was made by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just made by us. The Holy Spirit led us to make this decision. So whenever people argue and, and they talk about how um, that we should still follow all of these specific rules and regulations that the Old Testament lays out for us in the Old Testament law, yes, a lot of those things are so beneficial and they've got great purposes behind them. But the Holy Spirit clearly lays out that following all these things is not necessary for the Gentiles. That we are God's chosen people too set aside for Him, and we are not required to do those things. And so he says, to not lay greater burdens on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols. Though that really kind of it upset people because here we have people that are, are 
eating food that was offered to idols beforehand, like it's brought into a, a temple and literally dedicated to a false god, to an evil god, right? And then instead of the food just being thrown out, they would take it and they'd sell it in the market for less and they could buy this food for less. Um, but it really freaked people out because they're like, what are you doing? You're eating food that's, that was literally offered to, to idols. And we know that later on, um, I believe it was, was it Hebrews or Galatians, Rod, that talks about um, that it doesn't matter if you eat that, but it's the whole purpose behind it. Galatians, right? You can find that in Galatians where he lays it out. He's like, look, it's not completely against the law to do this. It's just simply not beneficial, and it's, it's, um, it messes with people's heads. That's why they're laying it out to not do that. He says, don't eat meat offered to idols, or, um, and also to abstain from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals. Eating blood, like drinking blood and stuff, that was... That was something that, um, that a lot of people did back then because they believed that drinking the blood from an animal would give them more power and all that stuff. It's, it's, it's demonic and, and all that. It's not talking about, you know, eating a steak that's not fully cooked all the way, you know? Talking about drinking blood of, of these things or eating the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is not beneficial for anybody. But isn't it a massive thing that gets its nasty hooks in people? You know? And God has not created us for that. God didn't create me for anybody else other than that woman right there. My wife, Brittany. That's who I pointed to, just in case anybody was wondering. So... Yes, I should make that clear. <laughs> Some people don't know who you are. <laughs> They're like, oh, wow, what's going on? But he says, if you do this, you will do well. End of story. If you do these things, you'll do well. Don't worry about the rest of it. Obviously, the Ten Commandments, you know, the moral laws, we've got to follow those. But these things... Were burdening people. They were frustrated. So many things were being put on them. And he says, so listen, just do these things. You'll be just fine. Then just like he says, greetings, he says, farewell. Thanks. See you later. It says, the messengers went at once to Antioch, and they called a general meeting on the, um, of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judas and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. I love that, man. They get to come in. They get to hear somebody else talk for a little bit. And these guys, they were, uh, they were both prophets. And they just started encouraging them through the Holy Spirit, you know. They were building them up in their most holy faith, and they were, they were encouraging them to go out and impact their area of influence. And they were, just, they were just loving it. It says, They stayed for a while, and then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, and uh, they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord there. It's interesting how, how long Paul and Barnabas and, and these guys would stay in different places. You know, it was literally as long as the Lord gave them grace to be there. But then, here we are in verse 36, chapter 15, verse 36. It says, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, hey, dude. He didn't really say, hey, dude. He says, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. Remember, um, Mark is, is the Mark from the Gospel of Mark, and it was Barnabas' cousin. He left them. Well, we'll get to that. It says, but Paul disagreed strongly. Here's Paul and Barnabas, two great friends that have been doing missions for quite some time together. 
serving in church together, building up church leaders, showing the church how to operate. And it says that Paul disagreed with him strongly, or sharply disagreed with him even. Since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. So I don't know exactly what all took place, like what kind of stress that put on these guys, or if, or if Paul just considered that like disrespectful. You know, you agreed to come along and now you're not. I, I'm sure that everybody had to carry their own weight and they probably all, all had their own responsibilities. But Paul was not real thrilled with John Mark's actions. And so he didn't want to bring him back along. And it says, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. They decided, you know what? This just isn't working out. I'm going this way. You're going that way. Love you. We'll see you later. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas. And as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and uh, Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. This is the last time we really hear about um, Barnabas. But I do find it interesting that he continued on, and he continued to go check on the churches and stuff. He continued on in his mission furthering the kingdom of God, and sometimes it takes difficult things to accomplish the task and purposes that God has for us. And here's, here's a, a, another point to that. Remember whenever Jesus is up on the mountain with uh, his disciples and he says, go into all nations, um, teaching and preaching, you know, healing sick, raising the dead, and then Right before he's taken up into heaven, he does kind of the same thing and says, go out and, uh, and preach the gospel. You know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, all those things. And then he goes up into heaven and nobody went anywhere. Nobody did anything. I mean, they, they were teaching and preaching right there in Jerusalem, but nobody left the area. Jesus just told them, go. Go out into all these places. And they did it. And so then they started coming under some significant persecution. And so then they started to disperse a little bit. Sometimes things are going to happen in our lives that that are uncomfortable, but still bring about God's purposes and plans that He has for your life. So just because there's a little rub there, or maybe a lot of rub, don't think that good can't come out of it says that he works all things together for the good of, lo- of those who love him. So, yeah, that's uh, Acts chapter 15. I hope you enjoyed it. Not next week. Next week we've got Bibles and brunch, but then the week after that, Rod is going to hit um, chapter 16. That will be fun. And uh, guys, as we, as we close today, I want you to remember that we serve a mighty and awesome God. He is strong to save. He's mighty to save. He can heal you. He can restore brokenness. Hearts are physical or, or whatever. Mental, emotional, it doesn't matter. Like he's, He is the great physician. If you have anything that you need prayer for, please come up receive prayer. We, we will have a little bit of worship music playing, but if you need to leave, that's fine. Um, please remember to pick up your children. And um, yeah, just go in peace. But definitely, if you need prayer for healing or salvation or anything like that whatsoever, please come up and, and receive it. We love you guys. Thank you very much for being with us today. Please go out and impact your area of influence. Tell somebody about God. Tell multiple people about God. Show them Him. Okay? That's what we're here for. We won't be here too much longer. All right. Love you guys. Have a great day.